Climate change is underway, and we can already experience personally its effects in the rise of extreme weather events. Climate scientists have convincingly shown us that if we do not rapidly reduce our emissions, the impact of climate change on the environment will become more and more severe. We can expect loss of biodiversity, forest fires, and rising sea levels, among others. Often, commentators oppose the environment and the economy. But in my opinion, as an economist, this view is far too short-sighted. Economic research shows that climate change will have detrimental effect on the economy itself. In other words, if we do nothing, we will not only destroy our nature in the future, we will also lower our prosperity. It's precisely this effect on the economy that I would like to look at, you, at with you today. My name is David Emus. I'm the UBS Foundation Associate Professor of Economics of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Department for Economics at the University of Zurich. I'm very happy to have Lynn Barrage with us today, who is an absolute expert in climate economics and finance. Lynn is an Associate Professor of Energy and Climate Economics at ETH Zurich. Her work focuses on how environmental processes and policies affect macroeconomic outcomes and human welfare. She brings a multi-methodological approach to this agenda, combining tools from different fields in order to leverage new data, empirical, and theoretical advancements. Today, Lint will speak to us about the financial risks of climate change. But before we start, here is some information for the audience. After the presentation, we have a Q&A. You can ask questions during Lint's presentation or vote on those questions. So please take your mobile phone or open a new tab in your internet browser and go to menti.com and dial in with the code 129079. Press Open Q&A. Even if you don't have any question, you can still log in and see the submitted questions and also vote for the best one by giving them a thumbs up. And now uh, I leave the floor to Lynn. Lynn, your turn. All right. Thank you. So I'd like to start today by discussing the global climate outlook. Despite growing attention towards climate change in the past years by the public, the private sector, and governments alike, at a global level, policies in place arguably remain grossly insufficient for international policy objectives. On this graph, we have projections from the DICE climate economic model of global carbon dioxide emissions over the next decades across four different policy scenarios. The red line with triangle shows projections based on current policies in place, in which case CO2 emissions are projected to continue to increase in the coming decades. This is in stark contrast to what CO2 emissions would need to be doing if the world wanted to limit warming to 2 degrees centigrade over pre-industrial levels. The emissions trajectory associated with limiting warming to 2 degrees is shown in the green line with crosses. The Paris Climate Agreement, shown here in blue dash, has been tremendously helpful in bringing down emissions and may continue to do so in the future if extended, but depending on what that looks like, may also not be sufficient to limit warming to 2 degrees Celsius. So what does this mean for the global climate? According to our benchmark projections, with current policies in place, global mean surface temperatures will reach 3.8 degrees over pre-industrial levels by 2100. Now, why is this? I think living in countries where climate is front and center and where there's been a lot of policy efforts, it may be surprising to see these projections. At the global level, however, according to estimates by the International Monetary Fund, most emissions of greenhouse gases remain effectively unregulated or rather unpriced. So on average, at the global level, the average ton of carbon dioxide emissions is priced at only about $3 per ton. So most polluters, and polluters includes all of us, still do not face much of a financial incentive to reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases. $3 per ton is far below what would be required either to make polluters pay for the damages they impose on the rest of society and future generations, or what would be required again to meet some of the international policy objectives such as limiting warming to 2 degrees Celsius. According to various estimates, that number would need to be between $60 and $190 per ton carbon dioxide emissions. In fact, around the world, many countries continue to subsidize both the production and the consumption of fossil fuels. According to International Energy Agency estimates, last year the subsidization of fossil fuel consumption was over $1 trillion at the global level up significantly from the year before, in part because of the energy crisis and government's desires to help consumers deal with increasing energy costs. 
I'd now like to ask uh, people, I'm curious what everyone thinks that will be the economic impact of 3.8 degrees warming by 2100. And in particular, we'd like to ask what you think would be the annual percent change in GDP as a result of 3.8 degrees warming by 2100. So each year, the effective tax on the global economy resulting from 3.8 degrees uh, warming by 2100. So not the cumulative effect from now until then, but the annual effect at that point in time. So we see some estimates coming in at a quite substantial level already. So we're seeing estimates coming in across the distribution from 0 to 100 uh, percent. Interestingly, the central value continues to be around 25, 24, 28 percent of GDP lost every year in 2100 from 3.8 degrees warming. We see, though, the distribution, some people choosing very high values and also quite a few people choosing lower values. So I'd like to now move to another question for context and benchmarking. And please. Don't look this up because that would defeat the purpose of, of asking the question. But as per your recollections or perceptions, what was the change in global GDP during the COVID pandemic and lockdown in 2020? So what was the percent change in global GDP as a result of the COVID pandemic in 2020 at the global level? So we're again asking folks to choose on the slider between zero and 100% the year over year difference in gross domestic product at the world level during the COVID pandemic. All right, so we're seeing more and more estimates coming in. The central value right now is about 11.2%. We see quite a bit of clustering, though, in lower ranges and also some, some bigger answers, I think some also looking towards uh, 50 50% 50 around. So, of course, we only have a true benchmarking for the second of these questions. The global real GDP change during the COVID pandemic was about 3%, so significantly lower than, than uh, the estimates that were just coming in. For climate change, of course, none of us know what the future is, and there is disagreement across studies as to what the economic impacts might be. But one number, one estimate that's based on a synthesis of 57 different estimates from various studies of what the economic impacts of climate change by 2100 might be, suggests about a 5% annual GDP equivalent loss from 3.8 degree warming by 2100. Projections for the annual GDP loss or GDP equivalent loss rather associated with climate change across the different policy scenarios discussed before are shown in this graph, where again with current policies in place, the effective climate tax on the global economy is projected to reach 5% of GDP by the end of the century. Now, what is this number? What is and isn't included? So there are broadly two different approaches that economists use to quantify the potential economic impacts of climate change. One, the so-called bottom-up approach, uses quantifications of impacts across different sectors, such as agriculture and energy, and adds them up to an overall number. These types of studies typically account for climate change impacts through changes in agricultural productivity, in energy consumption, increased in cooling costs, decreases also in heating costs, changes in mortality through both temperature extremes or disease vector changes, sea level rise effects on land and capital, labor productivity impacts, as well as various other channels that differ depending on the precise study. 
And on the graph that's on the side is a fairly representative estimate from the end linkages models from the OECD, showing for different countries and regions the predicted GDP effects of climate change in 2060 relative to a hypothetical world without climate change. Now the emission scenario that's assumed by the authors projects 2.5 degrees warming over pre-industrial temperatures by 2060. So if the numbers look smaller than the numbers shown before, that's because it refers to climate impacts at a lower temperature level. The main takeaways from this graph include the following. First, impacts are projected to vary across countries. Some countries, such as Russia and Canada, are projected to potentially benefit from a warmer globe. But the world overall, as well as many other countries, are projected to suffer. Countries that are already warm and already poor are among those projected to have the biggest impacts. So in India, for example, GDP impacts of even 2.5 degrees warming are predicted to be in excess of 4% in this study. The final takeaway from this graph, looking at world impacts in the bottom row, is that much of the impact comes from agriculture and health impacts. And this is something that has also been found in other studies that agriculture as well as health are two of the important channels through which we expect climate change to affect our economy and well-being. A second approach to quantifying climate change impacts is a so-called top-down approach where economists use historical data on GDP, temperatures and precipitation to tease out relationships and make projections into the future. These studies capture anything that in the past has been an effect of warmer temperatures on GDP, any mechanism that we may not even be aware of, but depending on the study design may only capture short or medium effects of warming. So what isn't included in our impact estimates? There is a long list. There are many climate change impacts that we know from science are expected to occur, but are notoriously difficult to quantify into dollar terms. For example, biodiversity loss. We continue to learn more about the economic importance of biodiversity every day. Uh, there is an excellent study right now out of the University of Chicago, for example, looking at the impact that the clients in vulture populations in India have had on mortality there. Now that's not related to climate change. It happened that there was a, a painkiller drug for cows where the patent expired and it was prescribed more, but then when the vultures eat the cow carcasses, it kills the vultures. And that is linked to significant increases in mortality from increases in animal carcasses left around. These kinds of unexpected but quantitatively important effects is something that we just don't know enough about to put arguably a reasonable dollar value on biodiversity loss. And the same is true for some other impacts such as ocean acidification. Another climate change impact channel that I think might come as a surprise is not included in many of the benchmark estimates we use are the effects of changes in natural disaster risk, such as changes in the probability of wildfires, tropical cyclones, or inland flooding events. So these kinds of events affect the economy through a number of channels. On the one hand, for example, extreme storms have direct costs. They destroy valuable assets, homes, cars, livestock, etc. And of course, they also lead to loss of life, affecting both economic well-being in general and human capital or the ability of societies to produce. There are also indirect costs. For example, extreme weather events decrease economic productivity. You may well have a factory and a workforce, but if there's a power outage, you still can't produce anything. Or you may have a factory and a workforce, but if the roads are disrupted and transportation networks are disrupted, it's still difficult to produce. So the amount that we can produce with the assets we have may decline in the aftermath of natural disasters. Natural disasters can also lead to supply chain disruptions, thus affecting the productivity of firms far away from where impacts may have occurred. Natural disasters also have fiscal costs, requiring public expenditures for cleanup, disaster assistance, health care. These public expenditures, of course, have a benefit, but also a cost, requiring either budget cuts elsewhere or tax increases to pay for them, which in turn have macroeconomic costs again. Natural disaster risk, and particularly risk increases into the future, also affect our economic well-being just from increasing uncertainty. People are generally risk averse, and so if we make the world a less certain place, there is an economic cost associated with that. Finally, the riskiness and often difficulty in insuring against natural disasters also alters the savings and investment decisions that people make. And I think it's noteworthy that natural disaster impacts globally, the majority of them are uninsured. Even in mature economies, for example in the United States, only about half of hurricane damages tend to be insured. 
And when we go into emerging market economies, often the insured fraction is as low as the single digits. So taking tropical cyclones or typhoons or hurricanes as an example, how might changes in risk from a changing climate affect the macroeconomy? So first, that tropical cyclone risks are projected to change differentially across the world, but significantly in some places as a result of the global warming. So on this graph, we have for four example countries, comparisons of the current or historical distribution of tropical cyclones, cyclone risk, and in white, the predicted future distribution of tropical cyclone risk under a high warming scenario by the end of the century. And to be clear, the risk here is the maximum wind speed of cyclones at landfall each year. So this can change both if there is more storms or if storms become more intense. For the United States, comparing historical in blue versus projected future in white, we see a clear right shift, meaning an increase in the annual distribution of hurricane risks that the United States is projected to change. But impacts in other regions are more nuanced. In Vietnam, for example, we see that there's predicted to be both an increase in average cyclone activity, but also an increase in the spread or variability of cyclone activity. And this spread, again, has an independent economic cost in addition to an increase in average damages. Other regions in India, we see an increase in the mean, but actually somewhat of a decline in the variability. And some regions of the world may even see a slight reduction in cyclone activity. Now, in order to gauge what the macroeconomic consequences of these risk changes may be, in joint work with Laura Bakkinson, we first look to historical data, economic as well as satellite-based measures of storms, to quantify cyclone impacts on physical capital stocks, on human capital, and on economic productivity. We find that the impacts of tropical storms vary with both country and storm characteristics. So on the one hand, as wind speeds increase, we and many other studies have found that economic damages rise quite rapidly. But the extent to which countries are vulnerable to disasters in an economic sense often declines as countries become more prosperous and also develop better financial markets that aid in recovery. Now we use these estimated relationships as well as future projections to project how cyclone risk changes might affect macroeconomies that are vulnerable to them. And the results are shown in this graph. So for each of the countries listed in this graph, we have in light gray the estimated effect of current day cyclone risk on average annual economic growth, and in black the projected impact of future cyclone risk with the warm climate on average annual economic growth. And we see that in many countries, particularly poor and small island states in vulnerable areas, climate change is projected to significantly decrease economic growth prospects through increases in cyclone risk alone. We also see a quite uh, somewhat of an outlier in risk increases in the United States. And this is on the one hand because the United States is predicted to receive a quite strong hurricane increase in the North Atlantic Basin. And also because, as other studies have found, the United States appears not to decrease cyclone risk vulnerability with rising incomes in the way that many other countries do. But so the key point here is just to highlight that some of these uh, climate change impacts that are not included in many of the estimates that were reflected in the numbers I showed you before have the potential to lead to further macroeconomic costs. I should also note that these estimates do not yet account for some potentially important impact channels. For example, they do not account for the interaction between sea level rise and cyclone risk changes. Now intuitively we might think this should be very important, but many studies focus on one or the other, in part because the modeling required to account for both is, is, is somewhat of a separate machinery one would need to set up. The estimates don't account for supply chain disruptions. They also don't account for fiscal effects. And in some other work I've estimated that in the United States, for each 1% increase in government expenditure requirements per degree warming, the overall economic damages from climate change increase 20%. So potentially a high sensitivity to some of these fiscal impacts as well. More broadly, there's a lot of scholars around the world, a big community of scholars, working to improve our understanding of the economic impacts of climate change. And they've documented potential impacts through everything ranging from workplace injuries to airline network disruptions. Many of these estimates are not yet accounted in some of the big macroeconomic models and estimates I showed before. And so we should go on with an awareness that we have much still to learn about potential climate change impacts.
Now, in the last part of my remarks, I'd like to shift to discussing the capitalization of climate change risks into asset prices. So to what extent, if climate change is really going to have an economic impact, these impacts should be to some extent reflected in asset prices. So are they? And this is an important question. I think on the one hand, for anyone who holds financial or physical assets, you might want to know, does the price reflect climate risk? If not, might it devalue in the future? But also for the importance of, of the markets to provide appropriate incentives for adaptation to climate change. For example, if property developers can't fetch a safety premium from building a house in a safer location, they don't have full incentive to favor safer locations. So I want to start with housing as a natural sector in where to look at capitalization, in part because we can quantify the exposure of a given house to climate risks comparatively well. So one method that scholars frequently use is they construct statistically, looking at data from all types of houses from all sorts of places, they construct two statistically equal homes, same number of rooms, same square footage, same year built, etc., except one is projected to suffer a somewhat higher climate risk than the other and compare their purchase prices. So some recent evidence in the United States suggests that there may already be a reflection of sea level rise risks in housing prices. A study by Bernstein et al. found that a house that would be underwater after 30 centimeters of sea level rise already sells on average for 15% less than comparable homes not exposed to sea level rise. But there's two important caveats to this result. The first is that climate risk capitalization generally still appears incomplete. The other is that it's really a recent phenomenon. So more specifically in this particular context, we see a discount or a, a reflection of climate risk in property prices only for properties bought by people who will not live there, for investors and non-owner purchasers of homes who might arguably have access to better information about risks. Owners who buy homes to live in, we don't see a sea level rise discount. We also only see housing prices reflecting sea level rise risks in parts of the United States where belief in climate change is sufficiently high. And we also only see this capitalization since about 2012. And this pattern is something that occurs in other uh, asset categories as well. So this pattern of, yes, we see some emerging evidence of climate risk capitalization, but only over the past decade and still not yet fully, occurs in other settings. For example, a study by Hong et al. looked at whether equity prices in the food industry reflect drought trends. They find that past drought trends predict quite substantially future profitability in the food industry across countries. But this impact, this predictable effect of drought trends, does not yet appear to be reflected in equity prices in the food industry. Recent evidence has also found that municipal bonds appear to start to reflect climate risk. So the cost for municipalities of borrowing is higher for municipalities that face higher sea level rise exposure, but we only have started to see this since about 2013. Another study looking at agricultural land prices has found that since the 1980s, the capitalization of the climate change forecast has increased, but remains incomplete. So also only appears in areas with sufficiently widespread belief that climate change is happening. So why this pattern and what are the implications? So on the one hand, I think there's a lot of data to suggest that our awareness of climate change and concern over climate change has increased markedly in the past years. So in this graph from Pew Research, we see across different countries the percentage of survey respondents that say that they believe climate change to be a major threat. We see substantial increases across all the indicated countries. At the same time, information on exact climate risks faced by different locations and asset categories often remains limited or difficult to access. And there's also a lot of skepticism, not just in the United States, about climate change and climate science. So I'm curious, and we'd like to do another poll, of how well you know, or you feel that you know, projections for climate change impacts where you live, where you work, and affecting assets that you have, say, in your retirement account. How well do you know predictions of how many more days with temperatures above 35 degrees there will be, or what's the increase in the annual probability of a wildfire now versus uh, with the change in climate? What's the change in the probability of flash floods or extreme precipitation? How exposed are all the assets that you're invested in, either directly or through your pension? How well do you know climate risks as they might affect you 
your loved ones, or your assets. So we see some responses coming in. So tellingly so far, no one has chosen very well, which tells us something. A lot of people saying a little bit or moderately, ah, no, someone chose very well. That's good. All right, so about half of people are saying a little bit, 30% uh, moderately, some quite a bit, and only a very small fraction saying very well. So clearly this kind of information is essential for asset prices to reflect climate risks. And the importance of providing risk information uh, uh, is also evident looking just at today's risk. We don't even need to look at climate projections. For example, a recent study of flood risk capitalization into housing prices in the United States finds that present-day flood risk only fetches a discount in housing prices in states that have sufficiently strong risk disclosure laws or disclosure requirements. Some other work has also again found that once we start thinking about heterogeneity in the population, that some people may be better informed than others, it may be the very folks who are the least concerned or maybe have the not best information about risks who end up buying assets that are disproportionately exposed. So in some survey work uh, that I did with Laura Bakkinson in Rhode Island in the United States, we found that 40% of homeowners who live in high-risk flood zone areas indicate that they are not at all worried about flooding, whereas the plurality of their slightly inland neighbors said they would be very worried about flooding if they had moved to those homes. And the potential for this selection that those who are least concerned or least uh, informed in some cases choose to buy the risky assets creates a risk of overvaluation and future price corrections. Now more broadly, as I mentioned, research and our understanding of climate risks is still growing, and so we should expect uh, asset prices to continue to change as information becomes available going forward. So to summarize, once again, the climate policy outlook uh, from where I'm standing and, and, and what I've seen in the modeling is uh, not yet is still Problematic. <laughs> With current policies in place, we estimate about 3.8 degrees warming over pre-industrial levels by the end of the century. The economic stakes associated with this warming are large, with our benchmark estimates of about a 5% annual GDP equivalent loss as a result of business as usual warming. Now, an important caveat to that number is that we may still be missing many potentially important impact channels, such as changes in wildfire and other natural disaster risks. Asset prices are beginning to reflect climate risks, but capitalization appears incomplete and the evidence arguably is also still small. And finally, lack of information appears to inhibit or limit capitalization and is a concern that we should address going forward. Thank you. Good. Jillian, thank you very much for, for your presentation. Uh, before we start with our discussion, I would like to encourage our audience to ask questions on menti.com. Please go to menti.com and log in with the code 1290799. And let me perhaps ask the, the first question. So if I were you know, fossil fuels uh, advocate, I would say that you're telling us that the costs are around 5% uh, of GDP by 2100, but the world is growing at around 2% a year. So you know, why should I really care about the world in 2100 looking like the world in 2098 or 97 uh, in, and saving on uh, and you know, reducing climate, uh, climate change damages this way? Yeah, well, thanks for the question. It's a, it's, a, it's a good question. And I would say there are several factors to consider. The first is that the 5% number masks important heterogeneity. Some countries, particularly vulnerable countries, are predicted to see 20, 30, 40% GDP impact by the end of the century. So for some of those countries, the impact projections are existential. I would also again note that the 5% number may still be missing important impact factors. And I would also note that you know, in economics, it's all about marginal cost and marginal benefit. The optimal climate policy program, if we balance costs and benefits according to our estimate, would yield a net present value of about $100 trillion at the global level. That's nothing to sneeze at. Uh, and a benefit to be had, why would we leave that on the table? The last point I would make is that Uncertainty is only partly accounted for in these estimates. And 
there's a lot we still don't know. And so we can also think about the importance of climate policy as the importance of buying insurance against some unknown unknowns or some you know, remote but high impact possibilities in the climate outcomes that uh, might be much more severe than this sort of average estimate we might be expecting. Okay, thank you. And maybe perhaps uh, building on, on, your, on your question on, heterogene on uh, your comment uh, on heterogeneity. So when we project this cost in terms of cost of war GDP, uh, as you say, we're missing heterogeneity in cost, but it's also the case that, you know, if for instance, uh, you have large cost in Mali and uh, GDP in Mali decreases a lot, that's not really going to contribute too much to world GDP. So how could we account uh, of the, these factors better? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, as you said, GDP of Mali does not contribute meaningfully to world GDP, but for people in Mali, these climate impacts are more severe, A, because they're more vulnerable, and because every dollar means a lot more to a person in Mali than to a person in Switzerland, right? And so this is something that the GDP estimate does not reflect, as you note. Now, we can calculate welfare effects by taking heterogeneity and what does a dollar mean to a person in different countries at different points in time into account. But there are interesting questions that come up with this approach. Sometimes in our model we set up an optimization pro problem saying what would be if we had a benevolent world government, what kind of climate policy would it set? Taking into account impacts everywhere, abatement costs everywhere, what would a benevolent government want to do? But then if this benevolent government counts everybody the same and accounts for the fact that a franc means a lot more to someone in Mali than in Switzerland, the first order of business would not be climate policy. It would be to make massive transfers of wealth to poor countries. So what researchers sometimes do is to separate the distributional question from the climate question by assuming that the government or this hypothetical world government attaches a value to people in different countries in line with the current distribution of wealth around the world. Is that the right assumption to make? Is it an ethical assumption to make? What other approaches might we take? Those are huge questions. There's research on it, um, but I think it requires a broader societal debate. Good, thank you. Actually, there's a, a, a question online that builds a bit on, on this last point, which is that the, the negative effects of climate change highlights the inequalities between the affected countries, as you've said. So do the richer countries need to be held more accountable? It's an excellent question. Um, it's a question that falls somewhat outside of the realm of economics, I think. There's, there's a, a, an ethical question, there's a philosophical question, perhaps also a legal question, which is um, outside my area of expertise. I think certainly, um, my personal opinion is, is yes, <laughs> but that's, I, I can't really speak to that in my capacity as, as, as an economist. Okay, thank you. So, so you also mentioned uncertainty as important, and I saw at least uh, two questions on that. One is whether tipping points are counted in the type of estimates you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And the so second, uh, you know, a more specific question about what, what, has it, what is the probability that we have a reversal in the Gulf Stream current and that actually uh, Europe will become cooler instead of warmer? Ah, okay. So thanks for both those questions. So in terms of tipping points, Tipping point, expected tipping points impact are accounted for in the 5% number, specifically based on a recent study by Simon Dietz and others, that they construct a model of different tipping points in the climate system, what we know about what their economic impacts might be, and look at how accounting for all the different pip tipping points that have been studied might affect the overall economic impacts of carbon emissions. So that their estimate, we add to our damage estimates to account for tipping points. Um, but one might still argue another finding in the deed study of tipping points is that tipping points don't just change the average economic impacts of climate change, they've increased the variability of the economic impacts of climate change. So the world is more uncertain when we start to add tipping, excuse me, tipping points to our understanding. So there is now more uncertainty at you know, how much money are we going to have in 2050. And there are some studies that have done more full-fledged, you know, models with uncertainty, trying to account for tipping point impacts, but there are still, my understanding is there are still big questions about the quantifications of both tipping points themselves and their impacts. With respect to the North Atlantic Thermaline Circulation, I would refer the person asking the question to Tim Lenton, who's a climate scientist who's done a lot of work on tipping points, and, and I think Tim Lenton's work would have better answers than I would on the exact probabilities. Okay, fair enough. Um, but actually, since we, we're talking about you know complexity, in fact, there's, 
one quite popular question, which is that climate change is an incredibly complex uh, phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, how can you ac really create a model that's reliable at all to even quantify the damages of climate change? Well, <laughs> it's a good question, but I think, you know, one could ask the same question of, of, of the economy of monetary policy, right? The economy is a complicated animal, right? <laughs> uh, people are complicated and difficult to predict, but sometimes we need some structured way of thinking about a problem. And I think we need to, we need to use models with the appropriate caveats in mind. What are they good for? What aren't they good for? If we want to get a sense of the economic importance in climate change, then it helps to have the discipline of a model to think about what are the costs, what are the benefits, what are the key uncertainties, right? So I think constructing an estimate so that we can have a conversation about the economic importance of climate change is an important starting point. That's not to say that's the only thing we should be doing. It's not to say that cost-benefit maximization is the only approach we should bring to the table. But I think it is one we should bring because we have to make policy decisions. We have scarce resources in society. We only have so much money to divide between climate change and pediatric cancer research and, 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 and uh, you know, asteroid defense. Um, so I think cost-benefit analysis has a place. We do the best job we can with the appropriate caveats in mind. Okay. Thank you. Um, moving perhaps to, to questions that are more related to uh, financial markets. Uh, so how are financial institutions such as bank and insurance companies preparing for the financial risk of climate change? That's an excellent question and I would pose it to insurance companies and, and, and banks and financial institutions. I mean, insurance companies uh, obviously are devoting a lot of resources and modeling and have some expert modelers to think about climate risks. One thing I find interesting about insurance is that in some cases there are regulatory hurdles to taking full account of climate change projections. So for example, in California, where I lived until, until last year, um, there's regulations for rates that insur insurers can charge and what kind of information they can and cannot take into account in setting homeowner insurance rates. So they cannot take forward-looking wildfire risk projections into account. It has to be based as per regulations on certain past data, which makes it difficult to have appropriately priced insurance. And then some insurers are forced to drop insurance policies on some homeowners with potential repercussions for property markets. So what exactly are insurers doing? I would ask the insurers. I'm sure they're doing a lot. But I think from a policy perspective, the question is, are we helping insurers and banks prepare? Are we providing information? And are we providing a regulatory environment that facilitates um, everybody getting ready for what's to come? OK. And so actually, there's a perhaps slightly re re quite related question, which is, how can companies and financial institutions disclose their exposure to climate-related financial risk in a transparent and meaningful way? <sighs> well, I mean, there's obviously some guidance at the EU level uh, that's going to come into effect also next year for how to disclose these kinds of risks. And I think, in a way, we'll all have to, to learn and see and get experience with these disclosures, which ones work, which ones don't. I think there's a lot of open questions about this that it will take time and learning by doing to answer. So I, I don't have a simple answer to that um, because our understanding of these issues is, is still growing. Yeah. But, but actually, talking about uh, disclosure, you also have many companies making pledges to uh, net zero by 2050 or you know, similar, similar things. And there as well, there are questions of you know, how do we really disclose the emissions of that the company uh, ends up making? Do you have, you know, what is your sense of what private companies can actually do? What they can do or which disclosure? I mean, Both it's, actually, it's <laughs> what can they do and what is it that they're actually doing? It's very heterogeneous, right? It's, 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 it's very mixed. Some companies are doing a lot. Some companies have internal prices on carbon emissions. Some companies speak about climate, and I, I'm, I'm not an expert on this. My superficial impression is when looking at lobbying activities, maybe do something else in the background. I think it's extremely, extremely heterogeneous. Um, but obviously, th this is an all-hands-on-deck situation, climate change, right? We cannot do it without the private sector, without the expertise and the engagement of, of private finance. So all hands on deck, and actually be on deck, and don't then secretly put a hole into the ship. <laughs> um. So talking about financial risks, there's also you know, one other aspect, which is the fact that because of climate policy, you would have some stranded assets. Uh, 
how big is this problem? Should we be worried about the, uh, the stability of the financial system if somehow there is some policy that tells us, well, now we stop uh, uh, taking uh, fossil fuels out of the ground? It's an excellent question, and there's been... You know, there's been some modeling, I, I, I know it best from the, from the U.S. context, where, you know, it is, of course, a possibility, but how big are the macroeconomic effects? It depends. You know, oil and gas is important, very important in some countries, but overall expenditures on energy is about 3-4% of global GDP. Uh, that being said, you know, some countries or, or areas within countries that are very reliant on these resources, we've seen very adverse effects. For example, in the United States in parts where coal has declined, there are adverse effects on populations there, on household finance there, even on well-being, health and well-being of affected people. So um, from a macroeconomic perspective, I haven't seen much evidence suggesting it's a, it's a first order, it's a really big risk. But of course, if I were, you know, uh, an official in... in, in in countries where it's disproportionately important, then I might be more concerned. Okay, and maybe more generally beyond just stranded assets, do you see big risks from climate policy on financial markets? From climate policy? I think it would depend on what the policy looks like. Um, the evidence, I, I mean, of course, there's going to be an economic cost associated with climate policy, and it also depends on what that climate policy looks like. So some recent estimates for the United States, for example, compare two different ways of reducing U.S. emissions by 2036 by, I believe it was uh, 40 or 50 percent. And if that's done with a uniform carbon tax versus with a group of regulations, you know, energy efficiency standards, increased fuel economy standards, a moratorium on leasing of oil, coal, and gas on federal lands, et cetera. And by 2036, GDP is projected to be about 1.5% higher if we use a carbon price as opposed to the grouping of regulations. So 1.5% of GDP, again, is that large, is that small? Um, I think that's somewhat in the eye of the beholder, but what the regulations look like that we use, what the policies look like, are they developed together with industry and phased in in a way that's you know, conducive with still a competitive marketplace, or is it uh, something more heavy-handed and unexpected? I think that will tell us how big the potential impacts will be. Okay. And since we, we're talking about uh, you know, f financial markets, uh, is there a role for monetary policy to, to play a role there? Ah, what a great question. So, you know, monetary authorities in many countries have become very interested in climate over the past years. Um, and I think, I think it's an excellent thing. I think it's really important to pay attention to risks. For example, again, in the housing sector, if there is a climate bubble, we see that sudden home price devaluations are not good. So thinking about macroeconomic stability, I think it's something really important for monetary authorities to consider. How much can monetary authorities by themselves do to foster the green transition? The evidence I've seen suggests it's, it's somewhat limited because what can monetary authorities do? They can lower the cost of capital, for example, for, for, for uh, clean energy companies or for you know, green companies more broadly. But quantitatively, how much that can do compared to you know, broader regulations is, is, is somewhat limited. Doesn't mean there's not an important benefit to be had, but it won't get the job done in isolation. Um, maybe it's a very popular question, a bit, a bit more local, which is what, what would be relevant referendum that are needed in Switzerland? A relevant referendum? So what, you know, if you want to go start a, a petition so that uh, Switzerland does something in favor of, uh, of climate change, in, how would you frame it probably in order to First, get it passed. Unfortunately, the, so far it has not really uh, worked out. Uh, and what would it contain? Yes. Ooh, what a great question. So let, let me answer it in two parts. If I were the Swiss climate policy czar, what would I do? And then what about the political economy constraints of, of getting a referendum passed? So I think, you know, the most efficient way to reduce emissions is through a uniform price on carbon emissions. So the closer we can move the policy environment right now, right, different fuels are taxed at different rates and there's an ETS for parts of the economy but not others, the more we can move towards a harmonized approach, the better, the lower cost or emissions reductions are going to be. I also think that Switzerland has an outsized role to play in terms of supporting R&D on clean technologies, right? We haven't talked about this yet, but an essential piece of the global climate policy puzzle is more support for clean energy R&D. And I think Switzerland, as a small country, I would conjecture, 
uh, I don't know, formal modeling that fully develops this, but I would conjecture can make a disproportionate difference by supporting clean tech R&D. If we invented here a machine that could at scale suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, you know, we'd be done. So I think a uniform carbon price, the closer we can be to that, the better, and support for clean tech R&D. Now, the political economy side. So I actually have work in progress with one of my PhD students here looking at the referendum in 2021 and we use some uh, machine learning and traditional regression techniques to try to understand which communities voted for and against. We actually find that communities with unusually warm weather uh, in the weeks leading up to the referendum when we had voting materials at home were significantly more likely to vote in favor of the law. So maybe schedule the referendum in, <laughs> in uh, August. No, but, but in all seriousness, I think you know rural communities um, communities with higher car ownership per capita, lower public transit infra uh, infrastructure, are understandably concerned about the cost to them. And uh, so I think thinking about and also clearly communicating costs and benefits for different parts of the Swiss population, people who live in rural areas, maybe even the rebate, right? So rebate from carbon tax revenue right now is, is lump sum in part in Switzerland. If we target that rebate, more so for areas that are more affected by the tax, that face higher cost increases because of the tax, and communicating about this, taking those needs seriously, I think uh, is, is an important part. And perhaps also estimating and communicating about co-benefits, reductions in particulate matter pollution, just really what's in it for folks that are voting for or against it. I think the more seriously we take that, um, the better chances of passing. Okay, um, and in, in fact, me, you know, maybe getting a bit even closer. And so as, as economists, uh, how do you think we can effectively convey the economic consequences of climate change to policymakers in order to encourage them to take actions and mitigate the risk associated with climate change? Perhaps that's what we're trying to do here. Yes, yeah. perhaps that's, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're trying to do. Ah, it's a great question. It's a great question. I, I do think actually separating, staying true to being researchers is important and not moving over into being activists. Because I think we will be trusted and we will be trusted by a broader range of people if we stay true to just communicating what we find. Let others who have more expertise in, in, in you know, maybe public communication and, and advocacy play that role. Um, I think that's important personally, but just engaging in outreach. I hear from, so this is again from the United States, I hear from policymakers all the time, there's not enough opportunities to engage with scholars, there's not enough uh, communication in simple terms of the research, right? We like to, I'm talking fast, I'm talking a lot, this is what we do. Um, so I think improving the way we communicate and engaging more is important. Yeah. Good. Um, just let me check some question perhaps that so, in fact, there was one question about, yeah, so, you know, going back a bit to, to the role that Switzerland can play. So, the question is, like, is it, it's obvious that it would take a global effort to stop climate change since it's, it's a global phenomenon. Is it even realistic to achieve anything if you don't have all countries joining in? Oh, what a great question. And I actually saw an excellent presentation just today by, by Terry Everson about this, this exact uh, issue. So I think we need to be careful not to cast these debates in black and white. It's not either we fix the climate problem or we do nothing. It's all about every ton that you know, we reduce emission brings an economic benefit. As long as we achieve the emissions reduction sufficiently cheaply, that's a gain. Right? The further we can get away from 3.8 more towards a reasonable warming, the better. So I think it doesn't need to be all or nothing. And there's some innovative ideas um, about how to bring more countries to the table in, in solving the international cooperation problem on climate change. There's ideas of climate clubs where countries could potentially, you know, couple trade with environmental policy to incentivize more countries to join climate agreements. Um, I think there's a lot of ideas also of some fee-bait systems. Uh, you know, it will take a lot of debate and, and, and diverse expertise to map these, right now, a lot of the more academic ideas into potential political reality. But I think there's good ideas and we need to just keep working at it, keep having these conversations and, and every step forward is valuable. And actually, I would like to maybe go back to this idea of, uh, you know, uh, every single uh, ton of CO2 I is important. Sometimes the debate is phrased in terms of, well, we need to achieve two degrees. Uh, or 
something. Yeah. Uh, so what, what do you think about that? Do you think it's, kind of, it's still a useful uh, tool in order to, to generate uh, momentum towards climate action? Or do you think it can actually backfire? Because we may have this type of, of you know, consequences where we think, well, if we don't all do something, then it's not even worth it to, to act. I think it's, you said it perfectly, it's both, right? It's a, it's a, it's a great tool to mobilize action, uh, a, a great benchmark to have, but it shouldn't, I think, I'm, I share your concern that it might inhibit compromise that would be useful. So, you know, if you have one side of the debate that's very concerned about climate change saying, I will not support a policy if it doesn't get us two degrees, and that just stays a little bit short of, you know, where they could have met the other side with also valid economic concerns about transition costs and impacts, uh, that's, that's obviously harmful. So, I think it's both. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, let me perhaps take a few more questions. So... In fact, and you know, going to not necessarily a single uh, country uh, doing anything, what can individuals uh, do themselves? Oh, individuals. Well, I think nowadays there are so many tools for individuals to figure out their own carbon footprint. Um, there's calculators online. People can see anything from you know, changing their diet to, to, to how they travel and what electricity they consume. Uh, depending on the country, there's, there's also different options. But I think also having conversations about climate change with others, including others who might disagree with you. Nowadays, we are in such insulated bubbles of people who agree with us, right? The algorithms show us news that agree with us, and we, we, I think there's been a movement in many parts of society towards you know, not wanting to have debates because we're so concerned that if we allow debate, it becomes an existential threat. But I think we need to have these discussions and have them in a way that fosters compromise and try to understand people who disagree with you. That's the only way we're going to get more consensus to, to, to move forward. Yeah. And since we, we're talking about you know, individuals' reaction, do you think that consumer behavior can also be uh, a tool for an energy transition? Absolutely. I mean, consumer behavior, consumer movements, pressure that, that people, that students protesting have been putting on countries, uh, governments and companies have made a huge difference. I think those movements have been absolutely instrumental for the climate progress that we've seen. Good. Good. Uh, let me perhaps take... Uh, so one, one question that I'm actually quite interested about, uh, which is going back maybe to, to, to the estimate uh, of the effect of climate on uh, world GDP, so 5% was you know, one scenario. Uh, do you have a, a bit of an idea of the distribution, uh, the distribution across say, quantiles uh, of how big the estimates are across you know, for various models or you know, for taking into account different elements of percentage in the, in the climate system? <sighs> hmm. I have, that's an excellent question. So I'm, tr I, I have a sense of some of these numbers for individual studies that look at impacts through one particular channel, not for the overall. I mean, so as you said, let's, let's take a step back. What are the uncertainties? There's uncertainties in every step of the chain here of reasoning, right? What is the effect of two degrees on agricultural productivity? There's uncertainty there. What is the amount of warming that we get from a given emission scenario? There's uncertainty there. And I think the state of the art nowadays in, in sectoral climate change impact estimates is to do uh, you know, a sensitivity analysis over both sources of uncertainty. Uncertainty across different climate models, uncertainty across uh, you know, the variability of our estimate of, of the impacts. Um, so I would point interested folks to the Climate Impacts Lab at the University of Chicago. They do excellent uh, uncertainty analysis for the impacts they quantify. Um, in terms of just sort of climate, different climate models, actually one of the biggest sources of uncertainty for is uh, changes in GDP. Because how fast we grow in the coming decades is very important to determining what our CO2 emissions will be and also what our vulnerability to climate change will be. So there is one uh, multi-model uncertainty comparison, uh, Peter Christensen and co-authors, that found actually uncertainty over global income growth is, is very important. And when we looked, there was a question before, what is the point of having these models when the world is so complex? So William Nordhaus, uh, 2018 Nobel laureate, who developed one of the first climate economic models, um, he's been doing this since 1992, so he's now done 
out, compared his projections from the 90s and even the 70s to what we've seen. So we can kind of test the models and how good the models were. And for predicting present day concentrations, his 1992 projections were, were spot on. They're almost exactly right. But it's because of two offsetting, not errors, but just uh, uh, predictions that were slightly off. So one, he had under, or projections back then, underestimated how fast the costs of clean technologies would come down, and had also underestimated global GDP growth. You know, the Chinese growth miracle. People didn't see that coming. So those kinds of uncertainties, technology cost and economic growth, are also really important in informing this discussion. Good. And maybe just uh, one, last, uh, one last question. Mm -hmm. So you, you, know, you showed us that in the current model, uh, you, we will go to 3.8 degrees. What is your personal sense? Do you think it will go in, in, in that direction? Or do you, what, what do you predict uh, 2,100 will look like? Oh, what a good question. Uh, you know, I have, I have an infant and a toddler at home, and my kids will be in their 70s when the world enters the 22nd century. So I think about this a lot. This is not some abstract future generation. My children will be in this world, the people I love more than anything else in the world. And I'm hopeful that we won't get there. I'm hopeful that there's, you know, the effort that's been building, the, the movements that's been building will continue to mobilize. I'm hopeful that showing what the consequences might be, how big the stakes are, will incentivize action, and also that innovation will help us um, avoid the 3.8 degrees. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Thanks again, Linz, for, for a fantastic talk. I, I also would like to thank the audience for watching and for your questions. On June 7, we will have another webcast with Dina Pomerantz. Uh, research focuses on developing countries in particular on public finance, taxation, public procurement, and firm development. She works closely with the governments in Chile, Ecuador, and Kenya to analyze strategies to strengthen public finance capabilities and measure the impacts on government agencies, citizens, and firms. Please consider subscribing to our newsletter to receive updates on our events and activities. We look forward to welcoming you back in June. In the meantime, I invite you to follow the discussion on social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. You can also find all information on the UBS Center webpage, ubscenter.uzh.ch. Goodbye.